If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessel, your host, and I'd like to thank you for being with us here today. Well, we're in part two of a little uh, short series we're doing in this, uh, in this program on Seventh-day Adventism. And I have a very special guest with me to, to help in analyzing this particular group uh, with me in studio today. In fact, uh, if we can take a look at him on our monitor there. This is Wallace Slattery. He's written a very excellent book put out by Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company called Our Seventh-day Adventist False Prophets, A Former Insider Speaks Out. This book is uh, an outstanding one. It's one of the best I've seen on this particular subject, uh, dealing with the Seventh-day Adventist uh, organization from a Christian point of view. And it's short and sweet. It won't bore you to death with uh, a million theological points, but it gets right to the, 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 the meat of the situation in short order, so you don't have to spend all day trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, I highly recommend this book. You can contact our ministry or Wallace's ministry or uh, try to get hold of it through your local Christian bookstore, but uh, I can't I recommend it highly enough. Well, Wallace, uh, we've uh, uh, done a long series. We did a live radio show the other night together. We, uh, we've already done part one of this uh, short series we're doing. And uh, basically, just for the folks that may be seeing this for the first time and they missed all the other stuff I just mentioned, uh, just give a, a brief little background history of yourself, uh, what brought you to write this book, and then we'll get into some material that uh, you brought out in that, in that particular book. Well, you're looking at a person who was a Seventh-day Adventist for 44 years. In fact, uh, my, uh, both mine and my wife's families were Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, I was even a denominational worker, a teacher and principal for 10 years. Uh, back in the 1977, I began to have questions coming to my mind or things being brought to me regarding Seventh-day Adventism that I really couldn't answer. Questions having to do with the Adventist prophet and prophetess and founder of Seventh-day Adventism, Ellen White. I started researching these and the research finally bore fruition in 1980 when via Walter Ray I found out some tremendous revelations about Ellen White, things that were very, very different from what uh, I had always been taught. You might want to mention about Walter Ray's Adventism. book. This is Walter Ray's book, The White Lie, an extremely good book, I might add. And he just documents where she, uh, the Ellen G. White, the Seventh-day Adventist, uh, the prophetess, plagiarized volumes of material from other writers, or in some cases I know the Seventh-day Adventists like to say borrowed. <laughs> well, I have a problem with borrowed. I understand why they want to use it, but to me, when you borrow something, you return it. And I don't know that she ever returned any of the material she took. She didn't even put footnotes. She simply took their material and, then, and claimed it as her own, and not only that, but as divine inspiration. But these things were coming out in the late 1970s and uh, on into the early 1980s. Uh, I met with, Mr. Uh, with uh, Elder Ray. He was an Adventist minister. I uh, took it home, shared it with my wife. Uh, we were both stunned. We continued researching Seventh-day Adventism until finally in the spring of 1984, we submitted a letter of resignation to uh, the, ch uh, the church we were attending in Pennsylvania. Uh, I might add that uh, we are thrilled to death with the gospel. Uh, we would never go back, which I think is very typical of people who've left Adventism for the gospel. And. Uh, we're just mighty happy to share what we have learned with uh, others. Yes, now, speaking of that sharing, uh, we're going to get into uh, some of the research material that uh, my guest here was able to find in regard to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. First of all, I'd like to uh, bring your attention to some charts we, we have up here, and uh, I'm going to let uh, Wallace get into some information on these charts and 
about, basically we've got a picture here of Ellen G. White. We'll let him say a little bit of the brief history, and then we're going to get into some actual uh, sayings and teachings of Ellen G. White and so forth. So, uh, Wallace, can you uh, fill us in here on, uh, on this uh, chart here about the, the spirit of prophecy and her husband? Adventism likes to call Ellen White the spirit of prophecy. Uh, this is a picture of her standing there with her husband, James. Uh, you can certainly describe them as the co-founders of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, organization. Uh, she uh, started having visions in either the fall of 1844 or the early spring of 1845. The man at the bottom for many years was taught by Seventh-day Adventism to be the uh, man who came across the sanctuary theory in which Adventism decided that Jesus had entered the uh, most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary um, in the fall of 1844. Uh, actually, today we know it was a man named Crozier, C-R-O-Z-I-E-R. Uh, but uh, again, but she, the, she the early up leader. On this guy. Yes, yeah, she did. Or uh, Crozier, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, got the, came up with this doctrine of 1844. Right. Uh, investigative judgment and all these other types. Ellen, Ellen led Adventism until her death in 1915, fully expecting Christ to come any moment. Uh, obviously, the church has continued to grow since then. Today, it is a denomination of, I believe, over six million, and perhaps seven million at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fall of growing rapidly overseas extremely rapidly at the rate they are growing my understanding is by the year 2007 if they continued this rate of growth everyone in the world would be a seventh day adventist <laughs> i heard that well let's uh, go on to the next chart and uh, i want to just show our viewers real quick uh, something ellen g white said about herself and uh, and the kind of view she had of herself uh, right up here we've got uh, ellen g white god's prophet but now this is this is Ellen G. White herself speaking from uh, her vi from the the book I suppose Visions of Mrs. E. G. White Testimony the Testimonies Testimonies Okay, thirty one I guess that's what, volume 31. volume thirty one page sixty three Okay, and what she says is God was speaking through clay in these letters which I write now that's Ellen G. White talking about herself which I write in the testimonies I bear. I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Now, Wallace, that sounds like she's got a pretty high opinion of what she writes. Oh, yes. And uh, there are many other statements that could go along with this. Mm -hmm. As the White Estate itself has pointed out, in many cases, she seems to have set herself up as, the, shall we say, the uh, final uh, court of final resort. Uh, right. Uh, the, White Estelle, the White Estate itself has uh, stated as much. It yes, is very uh, dangerous in this right. thinking. In, in the long series we produced on this uh, four-part series, uh, you documented that quite well in the right. video series uh, from their, their own statements. But we've got one other quote here I want to give, and then we're getting into some actual research material you were able to find. Uh, down here uh, from Ellen G. White's Testimonies, Volume 5, page 661, where she says, When I send you a testimony of warning and reproof, many of you declare it to be merely the opinion of Sister White. And then she says, You have thereby insulted the Spirit of God. She has many more statements along the same lines. If you dared contradict her in mm -hmm. any of her writing, you were insulting the Spirit of God. Uh, so she doesn't like it when Led, you... It left the uh, people in some real conundrums. Right, and uh, obviously she doesn't want people to think that this is just her opinion on the matter. Right. She wants them to think it's God's opinion. So uh, with that, let's go to our uh, next chart here. This gets into some rather fasc fascinating stuff. Uh, Wallace, I'm going to let you... Uh, run with this. Uh, we, uh, we've we gone over this before in, in previous programs, but not in this uh, special uh, short program. Uh, was Sister White a true prophet? And uh, Wallace, I'll let you uh, go ahead and run with that. We have three uh, biblically based tests that we have set up here to test uh, Mrs. White by. Number one, the true prophet never writes factual mistakes of any substance. You can find that in Deuteronomy 18, 21, and 22. In fact, those verses say that if a prophet says it is and it isn't, you don't even have to respect that individual. Uh, second, the pro true prophet never disagrees with the Bible, you know, to the law and to the testimonies if they speak not according to his word and so on. And third, I think we can certainly would agree as uh, 
there by general revelation. The true, true prophet of God consistently maintains the highest ethical standards, especially in regards to his messages from God. Well, did she ever make substan substantive mistakes in her teachings? Well, there are many, but let's bring out some that are just uh, very uh, outstanding. Let's see what, how she describes the causation of volcanoes and earthquakes. Uh, pardon the misspelling of the volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Uh, you, weren't, uh, you may have been inspired, but I don't think that came from direct revelation. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the, let's go ahead. The action of the water. Now, this is Ellen White writing in Patriarchs and Prophets, one of her famous books. The action of the water upon the lime adds fury to the intense heat and causes earthquakes, volcanoes, and fiery issues. As the fire and water come in contact with ledges of rock and ore, there are heavy explosions underground, which sound like muffled thunder. The air is hot and suffocating. Uh, volcanic eruptions uh, follow. In other words, what she's saying here... That comes from her Patriarchs and Prophets That's right. Book. Is that, uh, and it's also before that, is she's pointing out that she's saying that there is coal and oil that is burning underground. This is what is causing all this as it comes in contact with the lime. Well, today we know, of course, that volcanoes are, and earthquakes are not caused by coal and oil catching on fire underground and so on. Uh, they are caused by the tectonic plates and the reaction they have upon each other, the movement, the separating and joining together and so on. There's no argument about that. She was wrong. Again, Deuteronomy 18 comes into play. She was scientifically very invalid. Shall we go to the second one? Yes. B, in 1856, Sister White taught that there were people alive who would live to see the seven plagues, I guess mentioned in Revelation, right. that's what she's talking about, at the end of time, or when the return of the Lord comes. You have to understand, Sister White uh, was teaching at this time that uh, Christ's coming was very, very uh, short, would come almost immediately. Now, we are very short in time uh, overall. I really can't get into it in a lot of detail, but let's simply point out that she was wrong again. Obviously, no one who was alive at that point, 1856, 1856 is alive today. Time has gone on. And so she, uh, but she spoke these things in a vision, uh, speaking for God. That's, that's an angel doing. talking. That's an right. angel speaking, according to her. And uh, I know she said in some <clears throat> direct quotes that she either speaks for God, what she says is either of God or the devil. That's correct. So if, uh, since God never makes a mistake, I guess it only leaves us one conclusion. Well, there, there are certainly deceitful uh, teachings. Let's go ahead. Yes. We have another okay, one. Okay, uh, letter C. Uh, in Spiritual Gifts, Sister White wrote, but if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. God purposed to destroy that powerful long-lived race that had corrupted their ways before him. Now I've got to change charts because we have a little more of, the, of the, the quote here. I'll bring that down, get the next one up at the top here. And uh, to finish it off, talking about amalgamation, it says, Every species of animal which God created were preserved in the ark. The confused species which God did not create, which were the results of amalgamation, were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost endless varieties of species of animals and in certain races of Men. Okay, this is, well, one of the, this is one of the most terrible statements I believe the uh, lady ever made. What she's saying here, amalgamation, if you check your dictionary, means combination. Let's read that into it. Uh, which were re the results of combination. These confused species were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been combination of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost endless varieties of species of animals and in certain races of men. Now, what does she mean by races of men? Now, this is documented in your book. Right, also. it is. Uriah Smith um, put out a book defending Ellen White, talking about this. And uh, Ellen White and James were so pleased with this book that they not only recommended, they bought a lot of copies of it to take around to camp meetings to peddle themselves. Uh, Uriah Smith is very specific in pointing out that uh, by this they mean, well, they, they pointed out as uh, specific examples of these races of men, uh, certain black races and certain races of Indians, uh, or certain tribes of Indians. I cannot imagine a more horrible thing to say about people who were created in the image of God than that.
Uh, it's interesting that uh, the Adventists taught this on up, even though it became increasingly embarrassing, on up until about 1947 when they said, well, it just means that there was a lot of interbreeding uh, among uh, uh, species, not that they um, interbred with animals. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a face-saving gesture that was made in the late 1940s. Mm -hmm. So, amazing. But uh, it gets more amazing as we keep moving through here, Wallace. Right. Uh, letter D here, coming from uh, uh, Words to Christian Mothers of Ellen G. White. She's, uh, it says, Ellen White taught that masturbation causes cancer, small heads and busts, misshapen heads, a, particular, a peculiar gait, small eyes that appear swollen at times, a sieve-like memory, spinal trouble, and weakened mental powers, among other disastrous results. Comments? I, th I think the uh, statement speaks for itself. Today we know that uh, none of these are caused by this. Not that re as Christians recommend a sexual uh, self-stimulation, but uh, none of these things are caused by it. So if she saw someone walking down uh, the way with a peculiar gait, she could tell what he's been up to. We've laughed about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, should we move? Yeah. Do, I'd like, I, well, I want to get to this next one because that's right. my favorite one. All right. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me bring this one up. I always, uh, this is always good for a laugh to me. But anyway, uh, Ellen White said, and where's the Christian mothers? And uh, the health reformer, and the uh, volume numbers and everything are there. Documentation's all there. Anyway, wigs overheat the brain and needlessly excite the system. Uh, she, she goes on stating that, you know, it uh, excites the animal part of the human body. Well, let me, let me read a quote on this. I, I right, okay. enjoy reading this actual quote from her, her you know, because she says a lot more than just that right. on this particular topic. But just to read the quote I have. The artificial hair and pads covering the base of the brain heat and excite the spinal nerve centering in the brain. The head should ever be kept cool. The heat caused by these artificials induces the blood to the brain. The action of the blood upon the lower or animal organs of the brain causes unnatural activity, which tends to be uh, for recklessness and, and morals, and the mind and heart is in danger of being corrupted. Many have lost their reason, have become hopelessly insane by following this deforming fashion. Yet the slaves to fashion will continue to thus dress their head and suffer horrible disease and premature death rather, be, rather than be found out of fashion. This is caused by wigs. So wigs can cause horrible death, disease, mental disorders. It's... It's a shocking thing, so uh, next time you consider a wig, just remember what Ellen G. White said. <laughs> now, uh, Wallace, it sounded like you wanted to get on, with time running out, you wanted to get on to some other things. I'd very much like to go into the shut door, if uh, we can move ahead of chart. Okay, let's see, did, uh, I hope I have that, I don't know if I have that chart up here. I do not have the shut door chart up here, but uh, go ahead and say something about okay. it. You don't have to show a chart. Certainly. The most uh, serious L error Ellen White ever taught was the one coming from her original vision that the door of probation for the world had closed in 1844, that no more sinners would be saved, that um, only the little band of believers would continue to be, uh, or w were viable for salvation. Uh, they held this for several years, on up perhaps into the early 1850s. In fact, I have statements uh, coming from the period of 1844, 1845, on up into the early 1850s about this. Uh, of course, time went on, babies were born, marriages were performed, and other people wanted to join the organization by the shut door. They could not join, so they quietly allowed this to lapse. Then Adventism, because it was so embarrassing, here we have a, a simple, pure statement by, or simple statement by Ellen White, which was terribly wrong, coming straight from her vision. But she and, always claimed to be coming from God right. himself. So they simply denied it. The Adventists denied that she had ever said this from her visions. Finally, in the early 1970s, the information got out, documents got out. It was very embarrassing to Adventism. Uh, I like this particular statement. Uh, this is coming from the uh, White Estate, that is the holder of uh, the, uh, the uh, Ellen White's records. One hundred, this book is called 101 Questions About uh, Ellen White in the Sanctuary. The White Estate admitted this. Ellen misinterpreted this vision. That's the first vision. She correctly understood that the day of salvation for the latter two groups, those who had either rejected or eventually left the Millerites, the group that they had started this whole thing, was passed. For them, the door was shut. But she correctly inc concluded, incorrectly concluded that no one could accept Christ after October 22. 
hear that. She correctly, con incorrectly concluded that no one could be accepted. That only the little flock of a few dozen remaining in the household of faith would be saved. Everyone else would be lost. Now, this is interesting because, you know, if you accept this, you are saying that Ellen misinterpreted the vision. Let's turn to 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. If you read that, you'll see that the true prophet, one of the tests of a prophet, does not ever interpret his, uh, his visions. Ellen not only interpreted the vision, she misinterpreted it according to this. Coming back to Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 and 21, if she was wrong, do we accept her word as a prophetess? Well, I think it's rather obvious, isn't it? That's correct. And uh, with that said, uh, we, the, we go on and on oh, on all it's, these, it's these quotations from Ellen G. White. That, days of it. Uh, I mean, we, we haven't even got into all the points where she contradicts the Bible, says, you know, all these crazy things uh, that uh, are almost a point blank at variance with the, the Word of God. Uh, would you think, you say it's safe to say that in Seventh-day Adventism with the, uh, the dietary laws, the keeping of the Sabbath, uh, with the investigative judgment that she had in that 1844 vision where uh, you're without a mediator, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to really stand before God in this investigative judgment that uh, she gets. It's given in her great controversy book. At the end of time, you stand before God without a mediator. What does that do to the very basis of Christianity? Right. It's all in her great con con uh, controversy book, which is heavily defended by the leadership oh, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Right. It, is her, it is her most prominent work. So this is uh, actual, th this investigative judgment and this great controversy book of hers and many other things she said over her, in all her 66 books, I guess she's written, uh, it really leads to a works, righteousness, uh, for salvation type of religion. You must perfect yourself so that at the time of the end you can stand before God without a mediator. Both my wife and I were taught that as, young, uh, as youth. So uh, this to me is a direct contradiction of the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. That's right. Not of works, also lest any man should boast. Also of Christ's saving grace. That's right. Now with that, I, 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 we're, you know, we've got a few minutes left here. I'd like to bring up this chart on... Uh, grace and the gospel works and uh, we'll take you know we'll spend our final time getting a little into the gospel my favorite because uh, the consequences of teaching a false gospel are great uh, now let's take a look here at this chart I've got here at the top the SDA that's short for Seventh-day Adventist uh, teaches works salvation uh, there is another gospel uh, they preach a work salvation gospel but uh, we're told in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, if any man come to you preaching another go gospel, let him be accursed, anathema in the Greeks, the strongest condemnation. Let him be damned to hell if he preaches another gospel. And uh, so what do we find in the scriptures? The scriptures teach clearly salvation is by grace, not by works. Point contradiction to Seventh-day Adventist doctrine and their prophetess, Ellen G. White. I've seen Seventh-day Adventists claim they hadn't sinned for years. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, it, they, they, have to, they have to do that. Otherwise, they'd have to admit that maybe they're going to be lost because they That's didn't right. uh, live sinlessly. We've got a couple of minutes left here, and uh, I'll just run through this chart, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up the show. Uh, Salvation by grace, basically point one, all men in all ages are lawbreakers. They're sinners, Romans 3.23. Uh, no man was ever saved by law keeping. Your scriptures for that are right there. For the simple reason that no man ever was a law keeper, uh, you know, since the fall. Uh, point three, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness in every age to everyone who believes. And of course, all your Romans 10.4 and so forth are all right there. Uh, before Moses came with the Ten Commandments and all that, uh, the, uh, we have Abraham being saved by grace, Romans 4. Uh, under Moses and the law, we have David being saved by grace, Romans chapter 4. In Christ's time, the thief on the cross, he was saved by grace, Luke chapter 23. Uh, and since Christ, uh, Paul is an example, saved by grace, Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. Therefore, works cannot save you. 
uh, and I've got the scriptures all here, Titus 3, 5, so forth, uh, judicially justify you, Romans 3, 27, following. Uh, works cannot forgive sin. They cannot, uh, works cannot receive the Spirit. Uh, work cannot get you elected for salvation. Works cannot uh, fulfill the law. Uh, you can't be called to God by works. Works won't do it. Works uh, cannot regenerate you. Works cannot obtain faith. Works cannot keep one safe. First, First Corinthians chapter three, verse fifteen. Now we're running out of time here, Wallace. Uh, with that said, uh, take uh, some moments here. Talk from your heart. Preach a little gospel, or whatever, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and tell our viewers about the gospel of salvation and how this relates to Seventh Day Adventists. Particularly if you're talking to Seventh Day Adventists. If I were talking to you as a dear Seventh Day Adventist uh, friend, I would like to say that there's so much more that I can teach you in just a little half hour or. Uh, one hour segment. Uh, perhaps you'd like to contact me at uh, uh, concerning my book, uh, Our Seventh day Adventist Falls Prophets. Uh, it has a lot of gospel in it. And you can contact uh, me at uh, Stepping Stones Ministry, Box L1124, Langhorn, L A N G H O R N E, Pennsylvania, 19047. And I'll be happy to send it out. It is, a, it is a pretty much a complete exposition on Seventh-day Adventism. I'd like to leave you with the word that you can experience free forgiveness it's merely by the acceptance of Jesus Christ. These works are, they are fruits. If you, and um, the Holy Spirit will work with you with these fruits. They're fine. But the salvation of Jesus Christ is something that is so exciting and once you've experienced it you never want to go back to the old works orientation of seventh day adventism praise the lord praise the lord remember works do not save you you do not do works to get saved you do works because you already are saved you love the lord and you want to do as he wills so just remember acts 16:31. what must i do to be saved believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved it doesn't say keep the sabbath uh, keep the dietary laws do this do that do the other it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, as uh, my dear guest was just saying, please feel free to call or write us and we'll be glad to help you in any way we can. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 